ordinarily, as you know, I'm not keen on raw speculations with no basis other than supposition. If I do end up making speculations or logical assumptions, I try to make a note of it so we know we're all on the same page. However, it would be wrong to say that making speculations, headcanon and thought experiments is not a fun thing to do. I personally just feel, if you're going to do that, you need to make it abundantly clear that that is the case, otherwise where are you? A world of confusion is where. Today though, I thought it would be fun to do just that, collapse the guardrails and just start thinking what if and why and who, because there are just so many possibilities when it comes to the mythical figure of the Emperor of Man, and he is mythical in M41. Basically, all the stuff that we hear, entirely unknown, unprovable, almost children's stories by the 41st millennium. I'm also trying today to not get too crazy with the theories because of course there are so many, but I want to stick with just the ones that I've mused over many times and that I think have some outside possibility of being plausible. We can never know if we'll truly even discover what the Emperor is. There are those who undoubtedly believe that they've got it all figured out already that it's not so complex, that it's nice and tidy and straightforward. But the truth is, we can't say that. Much of what we know of the Emperor is told to us through second-hand information, ancient memories, visions and dreams. It's possible that Robert Gulliman has a better idea than most at this point in time by M41, but even then we can't say that for sure. What he saw and interpreted has not been revealed to us in the detail that we would need necessary to make any concrete conclusions. Is the Emperor an alien being, a god, or the next stage of human evolution. Discuss. Now really I only want to throw in this first option here to appease dissenters who if I don't will surely drag me into the streets of law and beat me. But please accommodate my mini rant whereby I do get a little tired of hearing people explain about the shamans as if it's some mysterious secret history that only a few people know about. It's basically been 30 years at this point, it's really considered to be highly questionable and it's really something that everybody knows now. Much of the content in those original supplementary books of the first edition of 40k, be it The Lost and the Damned, Slaves to Darkness or even Rogue Trader, sit on what we might call at the very least somewhat outdated by now. They're great books, they're very interesting, but they are a little outdated and they have been superseded by other things because, as you know, I'm not fond of the R word, but I do consider that things have been, let's say, clarified when it comes to 40k or perhaps stronger, more plausible explanations just put forward. But as I say, I never really understand why people cling to those things as if they are unchangeable bastions of, you know, written in stone. They were the starting point, they have some relevance. But like most of 40k, it is a broad, broad melting pot, a puzzle, a jigsaw piece of tons of information that you just have to draw from and put together. But for some reason, one of those things that people do get really obsessively clingy about is this shaman theory. Lutin, what is this shaman theory? Yes, despite many of us who are in 40k probably for more than a few decades, you do have new people coming in all the time learning about the Imperium and M41. I see it literally every day in the comments on the channel. So one of the original explanations for the origin and I suppose ultimate purpose for the Emperor is that he is essentially the combined souls of ancient psychers. It is told to us that many thousands of years ago, and we're talking maybe 40,000, 45,000 years prior to the Horus Heresy, so somewhere in humanity's very, very ancient past, where we were still hunting with stone tools, painting in caves, tribal shamans became aware of the natural flowing energy in all things. They could feel something moving behind the blunt reality that all others lived in. And for some of those shamans, it went even further. It allowed them to feel and even predict the events and fortunes of others. It's not stated, but we could surmise that these were the very first stirrings of psychic humans. As time progressed, it became clear that the warp was becoming uncalm. They didn't know it as the warp, they just knew it as this sort of other realm. And the shamans who, like the Eldar, had been able to reincarnate were becoming no longer able to do so, probably for similar reasons. And this greatly concerned them, along with the fact that they could feel something malevolent which hadn't been present before. We're not talking chaos gods, we're just talking some disturbance there. This all seemed to be pointing toward very bad things in the future, and this combined with humanity's speeding development was making these shamans concerned for the future, and their ability to maintain control of this knowledge that they had gained and also from what they knew about the space behind reality that we now know as the warp. So the shamans began to speculate and foresee a time where humanity could be entirely disconnected from a relationship and understanding that they collectively held, 
and a future where humankind would be consumed instead by pure greed and ambition and destruction. I've always been moderately fine with this first part because it sort of makes a level of reasonable sense. Okay, ancient shamans had a true affinity with the warp, I think we could all accept that, and they felt that things were changing and noted that they couldn't reincarnate as before and felt they needed to do something about it. Okay. Where it loses me is the next part, where it explains how all the shamans of Earth gathered in one place to begin the longest and most important debate in the history of humanity. Now, if we're talking about that kind of Neolithic period, but that's still a pretty big area for people to come together. It apparently lasted for centuries, this kind of conglomeration of shamans, and in this time they were supposed to discuss and research. I'm not sure how or what they were researching, but they researched and concluded that they were all screwed, basically. Without some urgent action, they were going to be consumed into the warp when they were trying to reincarnate. So I have this big problem with the idea of these shamans, and remembering, like I say, we're in this very ancient time here all somehow gathering and then having some kind of senatorial debate about what to do. I mean, I suppose if we're talking about seriously ancient times here, maybe we should take it all with just a pinch of salt and consider it more myth and less literal. Uh, the shamans are spoken about collectively often as well, as if somehow across this entire continent they held some huge Zoom call. And I suppose if we want to be open-minded, Maybe it was just that, we could speculate and say that they could use their powers to communicate somewhat, not unlike astropaths. I think though, that's being very generous to the explanation. Or maybe it was more like Final Fantasy VII, they all just feel this strange need to be in one place together, and they don't really know why, but they're inexplicably drawn to a location where they would all then debate and formulate this grand plan. But regardless, these shamans realise that they may only be able to reincarnate a few more times, and they're condemned then to a mortal death left to whatever lays beyond, which they think is probably not good. They're already ancient in terms of lived experience, and they didn't want to accept this and sought instead a plan to escape the loss of this reincarnation ability, or at the least to sort of find a way around it. So they planned this mass death by poisoning themselves, which is pretty committed, Again, remembering we're talking about a time where there really isn't a calendar system or even a means of measuring time, so it's impressive that they could coordinate so specifically. Again, being lenient, maybe it didn't need to be that specific, and they just said, okay guys, after 40 moons, we're all going to do it, right? So the shamans all kill themselves, return to the warp pools of energy, and this time they don't come back individually, they combine themselves together to be reborn forever as the ultimate being, the new man, the figure who would eventually become known as the Emperor. His mind was all of them and none of them, he was himself and the collective souls of all. The only part I do like about this theoretical creation is this concept of the Emperor being something like a collective consciousness, in some sense. And this might go to some degree to help explain why sometimes others see the Emperor differently, and why he seems to have so many faces, never a true face. But that any who do seem to see this true self for a fraction of a second, they're often really disturbed or terrified. Then again, it could simply be explained away by the Emperor's psychic power, and him artificially projecting whatever he wants, because we know he has that power. This is why sometimes people speculate that the Emperor didn't just grow bigger over the millennia, he wasn't just this giant always, he allows himself to be seen as that scale. Or maybe he did just use his powers to make himself bigger after the Dark Age and the descent into the Galactic Apocalypse. Maybe Malkador found him as a more regular guy and then they took him to the big labyrinth under the Himalayas and they made him really big. Because back in human times like now, it would have drawn a fair degree of comment and made it pretty difficult to fit in if the Emperor was that big. Especially when you're functionally immortal as well and you're really trying to fly under the radar Highlander style. Now, I wanted this origin piece in this video about speculative theories related to the Emperor, primarily because of the age of this lore explanation, and the fact that one of my core principles for what can and can't be trusted hasn't happened when it comes to this detail in the lore, the 40k human history. And what that is, is that, as far as I can tell, this theory about the shaman soul blending has not been really restated nor referenced significantly since. Which for me, doesn't dismiss it completely, but it's a red flag that it might not be trustworthy anymore. Does that even matter today, because I'm just talking about whatever the hell we want? No. Additionally though, the Emperor has been described by even fellow Perpetuals as the strongest among them. 
meaning he is a perpetual also, or they believe that he is. The perpetuals, from what we can largely discern, are not created, they just appear through natural human production, like Erda and Ol P. So their assertion that the Emperor is a perpetual, it kind of conflicts with this concept of him being forged by suicidal shamans. So what is it? Do they just not know? Or another of the Emperor's lies? He just noticed that there were others like him and were not dying over the millennia and he said, oh, I'll just go with those guys. Worth noting though, that perhaps being a perpetual is not necessarily defined by how you came to be one. For example, Vulcan, Primarch of the Salamanders, is a perpetual, but he wasn't born through a natural process of just humans. Basically, he wasn't naturally created as a perpetual. He was artificially genetically forged, as were all the Primarchs. But of course, it's said that the Emperor based him using some of his own DNA, partially at least. And there are some instances also where people are able to be kind of given immortality for a period of time and then have it taken away. But the construction of Vulcan may explain why Vulcan got very lucky in being the Captain Scarlet of the Primarchs, one man fate deemed indestructible, convenient. When the Golden Throne was first activated, we knew that it took immense psychic power to be able to control it. So much so that it would later destroy Malkador, and in its earliest phase it only required 1000 psychers to power it. But as the Sister of Silence who was managing that engagement of those initial pods observed, she tried not to think about the fact that for every pod containing a Psyker being loaded into the Golden Throne Chamber from below that first time, there were nine other pods for each bay empty, meaning its total capacity was presumably around 10,000 Psykers. We don't know exactly how many Psykers are used to power the throne in M41, it may vary even day to day, but as per the 6th edition reference, it's certainly at least four or five times that original number. It's been speculated that this was to be the role of Magnus, Primarch of the Thousand Suns. I say speculated because, again, as often, it was Chaos who really showed us that possibility, so it's anybody's guess really. But it does seem pretty likely, knowing the Emperor, and that Malkador and the Emperor have expressed disappointment in Magnus, Malkador especially, and that the Emperor would have, without a spare thought, probably have used Magnus as something like a gigantic battery, or depending on how optimistic you want to be, maybe something like a coordinator of the Astronomicon, able to reach out and communicate and administrate galactic travel and communication networks, ambitious but seemingly feasible concept, but something which would have trapped and tied Magnus here forever. So it's kind of comical and ironic that of course the Emperor ended up trapped there instead. It should be noted just for clarity that the Astronomicon and the Golden Throne are very separate constructions in different places. The Golden Throne is buried deep, very deep, under the Emperor's Imperial Palace on Holy Terror, surrounded by thousands of chambers needed to sacrifice psychers to the Emperor on a daily basis. The Astronomicon has a similar construction with its Psyker chambers wrapping around it, again supposedly requiring 10,000 there, also located under where the Emperor's vast development of technological research and development was built, along with the vaults, armories, etc., under the peaks of what were the ancient past known as the Himalaya. So both are well protected, underground, but separate, and the two devices are linked by immense power conduits as seen from the Imperial Palace. Something though that has always troubled me is how easily dismissed it is that the Emperor is being continually fed so many human psychers. It's just accepted as a basic fact. They're not war casualties though, they're not soldiers drafted to defend their homeland on the borders of an Imperial system based on ideological principles. The psychers sacrificed to the Emperor are usually just rounded up like animals, terrified men, women, very often children, dragged through a hellish cold journey in space to terror, some of whom might lose their minds in the process, which is irrelevant really, and then methodically put to death, murdered if you will, to allow the Emperor another day of existence. And whilst that is important, you really start getting into ethical and philosophical discussion points there. It's actually one of the more disturbing aspects of 40k, and there are many, it's been elaborated on plenty, but this came from the Emperor's orders. It's clear that this was his plan, and it must have been his plan for some time because they had to think about this and construct the Golden Throne apparatus. It's such a troubling concept, it even made Custodes and other Sisters of Silence question what it meant for themselves and the future of humanity and the Imperium. The fact that these figures of such impeccable moral character and service to the Imperium would question the Emperor's actions should really give us massive pause for thought. 
yet it's mostly entirely dismissed by us, the audience, of 40k. This, among many other things, contributes to why I still have serious issues when it comes to just what the Emperor is and what his true intentions are, no matter how much rhetoric he puts out there. Because everywhere you look within the law of 40k, everywhere you see anybody who glimpses below the veil of what the Emperor wants you to see, comes away extremely disturbed and questioning just what they thought. Korax, Gilliman, Erda, of course Alanias person. Malkador even throws in some seemingly more blunt descriptions from time to time. The point being, the Emperor always appears with this warm, genteel, benevolent, soothing facade, his actions shrouded by philosophical and often deliberately confusing speeches which are meaningless to the people he's talking to. He's often kind of conversing with himself. This is why it's so absurd as well that the Emperor chose himself to be this immense golden superhuman, so beautiful that it literally appears to stun ordinary humans like a rabbit in the headlights, but when it's stripped away what hides beneath seems to be truly terrifying, a ruthless being with seemingly singular goals in mind, determined to enact them by any cost, any means necessary. Those early moral boundaries and promises of a new bright future for mankind collapsed almost before they had begun. Everywhere you look to someone who is genuinely close to the actions and methods of the Emperor, and not just those who would see him as a mythical godlike figure that must be obeyed and worshipped without question, seems to significantly ask themselves, is this okay? Because what we're doing here seems deeply, deeply wrong on every level. Everybody that's involved in something that's going on with the Emperor seems to have this perception, this feeling in them, that it's not right. We can get into that specifically a bit more when we eventually do part 5 of the Emperor series, but things like the raising of Monarchia, Lorgar, shorts like The Board is Set, First Lord of the Imperium, play heavily into questioning these very serious prospects that the Emperor deliberately and intentionally orchestrated the Horus Heresy which is mind-blowingly disturbing. If we roll all the way back to the very first time the torturous apparatus of the Golden Throne was switched on, it makes for a truly chilling vision. Whenever we say psychers fed to the Emperor, it is anonymous and ambiguous. But as we considered already, it's a terrifying, unpleasant thing. As one of the custodies observed after it had been used for the first time in Master of Mankind, the Sisters of Silence had enacted their secretive, unspoken sanction. They fed the throne with the lives of a thousand psychers. In every pod, he could see a corpse thrashed in its death throes, raking uselessly against the transparent panels. All of them were dead, every one of them, and none of them looked to have died swiftly and painlessly. It was also noted by Kyria, one of the Silent Sisters, who was deeply troubled by this. When her superior tries to set her straight by observing, we're not the engineers of the Imperium's change sister, we merely react to it. The Imperium change when Horus set his blinded eyes upon a throne he does not deserve. We do nothing but the Emperor's bidding. This is his will. This is what must be done. 1,000 souls, Kyria? Is that really so many? Is that such a sacrifice weighed against the consequences of doing nothing? But Kyria notes that 1,000 innocents nervously awaiting the soul binding they were falsely promised, 1,000 men, women and children believing they now go to serve their emperor. As her superior is reminding the sister of her duty and role and the critical importance of what they're doing in the wider scheme of things, the horrifying realisation of the sister is that 1,000 souls, what do the calculations state? How long will they last? And the mistress of the Black Fleet lifts her hood back into place covering her silver hair and she says they will burn for one day, she signs to her. The sister Kyria thinks to herself, what of tomorrow? 1,000 souls today? And she has of course realised this unbearable reality, that these 1,000 innocents are merely one single day. From here on, it's an unrelenting, torturous slaughter of humans. So this to me has often raised the question, nobody actually knows how the Golden Throne works, in terms of exactly what it's doing. We know what it's supposed to do, but only the Emperor knows this, seemingly. He says as much when speaking with his custodies. In fact, the Emperor even somewhat alludes that he isn't entirely sure if he made it himself. He seems, though, to be in something of a lucid state, as he is through much of Master of Mankind. And when discussing the throne device, he speaks to it as if it's some culmination of human knowledge, and that he somewhat can't take all the praise for its achievement, but of course that only with him could it have been possible at all, of course. So we're led to believe that this process fuels the Emperor now. The throne secures the doomed portal as well of the webway, and the Astronomicon is similarly powered by human sacrifice. 
most people assumed for the longest time that the Golden Throne was keeping the Emperor alive, but again, nobody ever really knows that. But instead we learned not so long ago the Emperor exists in a perpetual, see what I did there, state of life and death. He's continually dying and being reborn, trapped in an unreleased way. Remembering there are those in the Inquisition who consider that his soul needs to be poured into a new, appropriately pure vessel. It was Dan Abnett who was the one to reveal this potential cycle for the Emperor. It is though not at all clear if this was the Emperor's intention to exist in this state for so long, or if he's become inadvertently trapped, that what he really needs to be is not continually powered by psychodeaths, but to allow himself to be fully reborn, instead of dying and being injected with psychic energy on a daily basis. But if that were true, then why construct that entire system in the first place, and why set those orders from day one? He must have had some idea, or again, maybe he didn't have an idea, and as seems sometimes to be the case, he was just kind of winging it, didn't anticipate how things were going to play out. In truth, as Dan explained, the concept of the throne chamber on terror is something of a mythical thing itself, and one perhaps imagines something more akin to the underground frozen storage facility in Akira, with masses of cables obscuring whatever remains of the Emperor deep inside. The terminology of the corpse Emperor on the throne, who knows if his body truly even exists anymore. Whatever he once was has been twisted and whittled down to a husk of his former self. When Robert Gulliman went to see him, who knows how he actually sort of interacted there. Maybe it was merely a psychic projection. We know that the Emperor can do that. Like the Shamans though, was this perhaps the Emperor's goal all along? To instead harvest millions, likely now billions of souls into his body, so that he may indeed become, not unlike those in the warp, a new god. Even Malkador has made veiled references to this indispensability of the Emperor at times, and at one point said, quote, but will he be around forever? That is the great question, that is the current test, says Malkador, seemingly to become entirely consumed and distracted from his conversation with this huge consideration about will the Emperor be here forever? Does Malkador know something we don't, in terms of the true goal, and if the Emperor is a perpetual, why is he questioning that? He also seemed to suggest that without the Emperor, everything fails. Humanity needs the Emperor to rule them forever, like a god. The Emperor has now achieved this status of a god among nearly all of humanity for all intents and purposes, and if you join the dots, it's somehow difficult to not consider this was an intention for him, that maybe we as humble flashbags are incapable of truly comprehending just how vast and complex his plan was from the start. Then again, maybe we're just thinking far, far too hard about someone with ambitions above their ability, and the Emperor simply made a string of catastrophic mistakes. What tends to undermine the thinking along the lines of a convoluted grand plan is that there are several occasions, most notably perhaps in Master of Mankind, as it's one of the most clear accounts of the Emperor engaging and discussing with others about himself, and as a narrative it's also one of the most misquoted I think out there of the entire Heresy series. I've literally lost count of the number of times people have at me about something from Master of Mankind and then gone to check it to discover it was entirely misquoted or just plain wrong. But regardless, the Emperor does particularly, in this story, have a habit of conversing with people around him, telling them things which objectively gain him nothing, other than to present his case as that of a person or figure who is not fully in control and merely attempting to follow his best laid plans, and as and when forced to react to situations. Despite his foresight, it would seem, he was unable to foresee some critical pathways which again leads us into other discussion points about the functionality of time and the warp yet again. Often the Emperor seems to actually suggest that people don't have the ability to make decisions. He seems to suggest that decisions are already made and you are just acting this out. He even says so to Malkador, which again comes back to my idea that 40k exists as the eternalist point of view when it comes to time. A counterpoint could be that when you are a thing as complex as the Emperor, it's believable that he would present his manner and approach at all times regardless of whether he was truly sincere or not, much like a method actor, I suppose. So I don't think the Emperor appearing concerned at how all was not going to plan is necessarily indicative that this wasn't part of his plan, you might say, but it suddenly adds a single weight on the side of the scale that says maybe he didn't actually have an extremely convoluted, vast, grand master plan but maybe some details we have seen were elements of a broader attempt to hedge bets. But once you start thinking like that, it's where you really start going down into a rabbit hole of what ifs. So, moving on. 
Now, next is something that I have noted before, but very, very far back on the channel, almost at the beginning of the 40k videos, in fact. I always disliked this shaman explanation, but I do admit it has more weight in the actual lore than this concept of the emperor maybe being not a literal old one, but perhaps some kind of seed laid down by them. Now, as I always say, it's important to be clear about evidence, and this one is very, very much just my speculative head cannon. I like to imagine it's possible, at least, that some rogue old one, perhaps who was involved in the creation of a race such as the Eldar, had been living on a planet alone to escape the horrors of the war in heaven, and after a significant amount of time, decided that it needed to do one last thing to attempt to lay revenge upon both the Necron and the Eldar, for that matter, for not preventing their destruction. So I imagine this old one dabbled in the earliest awakenings of what would become mankind, perhaps that Neolithic time where the Emperor and Old P may have appeared from. The old ones had seeded Earth itself long before, and so it has some idea already about how to manipulate us. After all, much like the Eldar, humanity is, for reasons that are not explained, moving toward a position of becoming psychic beings. And it was the Emperor's belief, as among perpetuals, that humanity will continue toward this trend of psychic evolution, maybe humanity emerging as a psychic race, and that this even was part of our original evolution, but maybe the emergence of perpetuals was due to interference from old ones. Why would I make this assumption at all? Well, it's worth to remember that the old ones are very adept at seemingly creating species that are very persistent and hard to permanently exterminate. The purpose for this was, of course, to give something capable of fighting against the Necron tier, who themselves had found a way to become functionally immortal, remembering that the Necron tier's original goal had been to gain that knowledge of how to be immortal from the Old Ones. So is it such a leap that the Old Ones wanted to just use that knowledge in the end by implanting it into humanity? So when you consider the Eldar as well, during their ancient history they were able to reincarnate from the warp endlessly, and coupled with their psychic powers, too difficult an enemy to overcome for the Necron tier, the Necron. Orcs as well, not as refined as the Eldar, but also believed to be a seeded life form of the Old Ones, regenerating insanely fast, incredibly persistent, and have powerful psychic ability generated by themselves, not requiring the warp as the Eldar do. So is it really that big of a jump when you look at the characteristics of humanity to consider there are some shared traits here? A powerful intelligence that gave us the abilities that made us strong enough at one point and position in time to make humanity the most powerful race in the galaxy during the zenith? A slow development of psychic ability and among some this emergence of both perpetuals and nulls? The old ones seem to have had a hand in seemingly most life in the galaxy. But it is, of course, so, so far back in history that it's little more than remnants, dust of mythology. No one can know just how involved they were in anything, but given that fact itself, it's worth surely at least to be an option open to consider the possibility that the Old Ones were somehow involved in humanity's development to a degree, and with that, perhaps a lone surviving Old One toiled away in caves upon Old Earth, forging the most powerful humanoid life form or version of life forms in perpetuals that it could fathom to make before it disappeared somehow forever. Then to follow on, I guess a fairly straightforward possibility when it comes to the Emperor, as he himself sometimes appears to believe all perpetuals are something akin to what humanity has the potential to become, not necessarily the immediate next evolutionary state for humanity, Perpetuals seem to be either abstractions, mutations, or perhaps leapfrogs in the advanced states of human form. Psychers now, more generally, seem to be where humanity is trending toward, although not if the Emperor keeps burning through them. The emergence of Psychers has continued unabated though since the Age of Strife, which is around M25 to M30, although very likely they did exist prior to this but were either not so powerful enough or avoided detection, more likely persecuted by other humans as witches and the like. The Emperor has been described by his fellow perpetuals as the most powerful among us, and the reason I'm mentioning this option is that potentially the Emperor is actually more bland in his origin story. Maybe it's not some grand, convoluted shaman plan or meddling ancient beings. Perhaps it literally was just fate and probability at play. The numbers just aligned, and the Emperor was a being produced by stock humanity. 
Again, the Emperor somewhat describes this himself as he talks to his past and senses his emerging power. He doesn't speak about how he actually came to be, just speaks about being a boy and sort of feeling his power, knowing that he can control others and basically murders somebody. That though could just be his immense latent power blinding himself from knowing just what he was in the beginning. Or if we're going to get more mysterious, maybe he can't remember. Maybe something happened between him and Malkador. Who knows? What helps support this idea though for me is that figure of Ol P, that Solanius person who is another perpetual who is supposed to be older and been active among humanity far before the Emperor. Ol describes himself as being by the time of the heresy somewhere around 45,000 years old making his birth, or however he came into existence, somewhere around 15,000 BC or 17,000 years BP, if you like. In this time period known as the Magdalenian, prehistoric humans lived around the area of Europe. It was a flourishing of human creativity beyond also pure survival, cave art, decoration of tools, engraving of stones and bones, so the beginnings of human culture. The Emperor, however, has been described as originating somewhere around 8000 BC, that's 10,000 BP. And we're talking very roughly because specifics are almost pointless here. What is interesting though, is that if true, then the fact that Ol P appears to have come into existence some six or 7,000 years prior to the Emperor, it's certainly suggestive that the Emperor is not the first perpetual. In some respects, this could also assist in adding a weight onto the scales of the shaman's story, in the sense that if perpetuals existed for thousands of years already, maybe they were in fact these early shamans who had learned that they were able to reincarnate from the warp, and thus the emperor is in fact something like a fusion of many perpetual souls from the warp. Hard to fathom, but we're throwing caution to the wind here, and it would help to explain about why he is so much more powerful than others. The more simple bottom line is, maybe it's not so confusing and convoluted. Maybe the Emperor just is what he says on the tin. A leap in human evolution, perpetuals seem to appear randomly throughout human history. Maybe he just happened to be an exceptionally powerful, random, freakish one for reasons unknown. Simple as that. Although, I hope it's not as simple as that, because that would be incredibly boring and irritating to be honest. So, it's heresy you're after then. Is the Emperor in actuality a god? You thought that was the heretical part? <laughs> no, the heretical part is this. What if Malice is the Emperor? Now for those of you not foaming at the mouth already or convulsing on the floor, there is of course the discussion about is the Emperor some kind of god? That's been ongoing forever and it's really something we need to look at in the proper Emperor series, not just this sideshow. But considering the status of Malice in the 40k verses, sort of not really spoken about but not really discontinued either, it's far more chaotically applicable. Now, I don't really have time to go into the more solid meat of what Malice is and why it is and isn't a thing. So if you want to know the whole story about Malice, just go watch my video about Malice. I've linked it directly below this video in the video notes, and it's also linked at the end of this video. For those who are familiar already with Malice and the fact that despite what some naysayers might tell you, Malice is definitely a thing still in the 40k lore, books referencing it have been republished, and video games featuring the Chaos Force Sons of Malice right to the present. So. It's a thing. And just for the sake of saying it, as I've noted before, things not being spoken about in 40k doesn't mean that they're not a thing anymore. There is a big history in the law of 40k where things do not get spoken about for like a decade and then they just come back again. But Malice is not a Chaos God in the more traditional sense. It doesn't appear to have a strong presence in the warp that we're aware of and it is anathema to the other Chaos Gods. Interesting, huh? Because what else is anathema to the Chaos Gods? the Emperor of Man. Malice, unlike the other gods of chaos though, doesn't seek domination. It seeks oblivion in the purest sense. Although Malice is often said to represent chaos in the purest form, anarchy, destruction, and seemingly the doom of the other chaos gods, like many of those, it can represent this in an indirect way, meaning its actions may be in the service of pure chaos, but it may seek to achieve them via a more ordered or convoluted means even if its followers, like the Sons of Malice themselves, do follow the path of disturbing, mad, mindless destruction. While the Chaos Gods fight amongst themselves, this being generally seen as an eternal struggle, a battle that can never truly be won, 
Whether they're truly aware of it or not is unknowable, but the Chaos Gods likely can't really defeat the others in this great game. To do so is presumed to then bring about the total implosion and cause some unknowable large-scale incident within the warp to occur. Some speculate this merely would be a reset of a calm state for the warp, but of course it could be far worse. It could simply be the galaxy and beyond tearing itself apart. There's something far greater than the Great Rift tears through the boundaries of real space and the immaterium. What some believe is that the unspoken fifth god Malice pushes back against the other Chaos Gods, but in a way that is not sought through selfish lusting for power and domination. Malice seeks only to further division, cause confusion, contradiction, to force others to tear themselves apart through anarchy vengeance. It seeks total oblivion. Now, I hear those of you standing at the back and shouting Lutin, the Emperor is all about order and control. It's true, of course, the entire thing about the Emperor is that he loves to take away people's chaotic natures and rule over them to a suffocating degree. From the very start, this really, though, didn't happen. It didn't in shades of grey, but every stage of the Emperor's grand plans caused more and more division and destruction. Has the Emperor been playing everybody all along, not a great crusade, but the great ruse, the great charade? The fact that Malice is always represented as a being of pure malevolence, pure chaos, is perhaps deliberately misdirecting. What Malice seeks to destroy is the other Chaos Gods. For one thing, it makes sense that Malice may not wish to reside within the warp as well. After all, it would then be constantly subject to all the horrors and powerful beings that seek its destruction. The Emperor has been trying to disconnect humanity from fueling the gods of the warp. This is his overarching goal, and thus to indirectly destroy Chaos. He may say that it's for the good of humanity, but after all the Emperor's lies and atrocities and contradictions and confusion, do you really believe that? In case you hadn't noticed, humanity ain't been doing too good for the past 10,000 years, and the Emperor sure as hell didn't seem to mind slaughter when it suited him, even before he was trapped on the Golden Throne. He presents himself as a benevolent protector, but whenever you look under the skin, it's a void, a void of darkness and destruction. All who know the Emperor find this terrifying. Many even tried to stop him and failed. The Emperor is the ultimate destroyer. He failed in suffocating the gods of chaos through logic, science, and an abandonment of superstition and mythology, the imperial truth, which was in fact the imperial lie. He's fallen back on the only path available, galactic endless war, thus enabling the powerful worship of himself, propagated by himself through his continual denials and extreme actions, challenging humanity that he knew could not help itself, but fall into a downward spiral of superstition and faith, leading to all of humanity to worship him and only him, thereby allowing him, it, malice, to rise to a level of supreme and ultimate power, whereby it will finally unleash its true nature upon its enemies in the warp in a final battle through all that it knows, destruction, pure chaos, vengeance. When the mask slips, some have seen that face beneath. Despite all his protests, the Emperor is not human. He is enraged when people see what is below not seeking the betterment of humanity, only the annihilation of those eternal enemies within the warp. The Emperor is Kaiser So- I, I mean Malice. Now, I apologise for the stupidity of that last entry, but it was fun to throw in something a little more crazy, even if it admittedly makes little sense. So let's switch to something more lore-based and serious. Less about directly the Emperor though, in terms of just what he is, more about what can we consider adjacent to him that helps us in revealing more understanding about the Emperor. One of the biggest keys to unlock of course ideas about the Emperor is Malkador. Malkador the Sigilite is very obviously one of the most enigmatic figures of Imperial history. He speaks very often in a tone similar to that of the Emperor, it comes across as metaphorical, allegorical, and again like the Emperor, at times lucid. Malkador, likely the most trusted advisor of the Emperor, a perpetual and an immensely powerful psyker. So powerful, he was the only one capable of sitting atop the Golden Throne other than the Emperor himself, despite it, of course, killing him. If you, you know, put to the side Magnus. Malkador states his age at being 6,718 years old by the time of the Heresy, a number he felt he could recall with specific accuracy. Although even that really is debatable. Just like the Emperor, Malkador appears to operate from an ends justifying any means necessary. He states this as much himself very clearly, 
and he is referenced being able to recall, for example, vineyards in France, walking among them. It's very suggestive that Malkador is in fact perhaps older than the few thousand years prior to the heresy, and this in itself raises the possibility that perhaps Malkador knew the emperor long before the Age of Strife and Unification. Malkador seems certainly to have been present during the Dark Age of Technology and has lived to see humanity fall into oblivion, relatively speaking, since the zenith of human achievement. The question though is, just how does Malkador and the Emperor relate to one another? By the time of the heresy, the Emperor always appears to be in the driving seat with confidence, or at least until you get into the latter stages of the heresy. But whenever we see Malkador and the Emperor either alone or when Malkador reveals tiny slivers of information that of course we can't fully trust, we get a slightly different picture. It always appears as if the Emperor is looking to Malkador for his lead, even though Malkador has said himself that the Emperor was not the Emperor until he met me, and also that Malkador always positions himself, of course, second to the Emperor. Now some assume this means very simplistically that Malkador just met the Emperor and said, hey, have you ever thought about calling yourself the Emperor of Man? It's got a nice ring to it. This to me always seems way too simple and kind of silly. I think there is very clearly a much deeper connection between the Emperor and Malkador because of how closely they connect and share and seem to be the only two individuals who've got a clue of what all of their grand plans are in the service of. Like so many things in 40k, there is a far darker past behind so much that is presented, Malkador truly being no exception. Like the Emperor, he presents to us an aging, fragile, largely caring figure, but it's through those as usual adjacent stories to the core narrative we see interesting details. If you've never read it, I highly recommend for one the story The Last Council. Just like First Lord of the Imperium and The Board is Set, it reveals to us disturbing details about the relationship and intentions behind the Emperor and Malkador. For one thing, Malkador is often presumed to be merely a powerful human psyker. But he's not just that, he's a perpetual like the Emperor, Erda, Ol P, and so on. His name was also not originally Malkador, but Bram al Kador, also known as the Cursed Wanderer. It is true though, seemingly he was part of this order known as the Sigilites, the protectors of culture, technology, and history, and thus why Malkador refers to himself as Malkador the Sigilite, or Last of the Sigilites. Now, this terminology by the time the heresy is upon humanity means almost nothing to so many. But for those able to discover the history, they would learn that the Sigilites were this powerful order, either they were tasked or took upon themselves the role of attempting to preserve, like we say, technology, weaponry, history, culture, essentially the power of humanity. And that doesn't necessarily mean purely weapons, it's the cultural artifacts, the knowledge, the keystones that make human civilization in the grand picture what it is. The Sigilites remained active until at least the founding of the first Astartes, but around this time, undetermined point, they're scattered, destroyed. Their fortress and all the vast wealth of technology and artifacts though remained. These preserved vaults of the zenith of humanity and previous were what would become the foundations deep below the Imperial Palace. Malkador being all that remained now would aid the Emperor in creating the next stage of human civilization and perhaps help guiding and focusing in what he needed to do, what he wanted to do. More disturbing though, in the last council, we see just how powerful Malkador truly is. For Malkador always exudes power, we hear this all the time, but rarely do you see him actively use it. And very often he presents himself as this very frail, old man clinging to his walking stick for dear life. Now, there may be some truth to his frailty, but it does also seem, again, a shrewd misdirection. Because when an outraged Horus storms to the council halls of terror to confront Malkador, who is enraged, this is prior to the heresy, enraged by the fact that one of the 20, one of the 20 Primarch statues, a fallen Primarch not named, is going to be crushed and pulled down as they no longer deserve to be honoured, Malkador has quite the response. Horus, Alpharius and the Khan are confronting Malkador, but the regent tires of Horus, especially when he dares to try and speak the name of this unnamed fallen Primarch. Instantly Malkador envelops Horus. With so much psychic power, he freezes him to the spot, 
forcing the Lupercal down to his knees, at one point even making his eyes bleed. He nearly crushes his windpipe, and it's only at the protest of the Khan does Malkador relent and release Horus. You get the impression that it was very close and it was only this intervention enough to stop Malkador being consumed by some kind of distant rage beneath him that he could have crushed Horus that day and ended him right there and then. A very visibly shaken Horus and the other Primarchs leave with all the bluster and wounded pride and ego that you'd expect, exclamations about this not being the end of it all and so forth. But this confrontation is what leads Horus to in part turn even maybe further away from the Emperor. He researches Malkador's past and the Khan eventually returns to Malkador during the time of the heresy now, explaining that he knows who Malkador truly is, which seems to significantly concern Malkador. He reveals that Horus has learned his name, as we said, is actually Brahm al Kador, the Cursed Wanderer. Worse, that they have learned that Malkador and the Sigilites during Old Night, the Age of Strife, committed mass scale atrocities upon humanity, but these are unspecified. The Khan tells that Horus seeks to reveal to all that the Imperial Truth was founded on lies from the very beginning and that the galaxy cannot therefore be justly ruled by our father or any who support it. When all is said and done though, Malkador attributes this to just past mistakes and essentially says, look, what use is it to worry about these past horrors now? He also dances around the evidence Horus has supposedly seen and he even implies that he knows precisely what he wanted to leave in existence and what to destroy. He's essentially saying, if Horus has that impression, that's the impression I wanted him to have. And for some reason, this seems to actually appease the Khan. The Sigilites appear to have had the ultimate goal of securing and preserving humanity's culture, and as Malkador puts it, the soul of humanity. Yet the fact that Horus seemed to have found information that points toward Malkador and his order performing horrifying atrocities prior to the unification and construction of the Imperial Palace is quite troubling mainly because we tend to see the heresy almost entirely from the perspective of the loyalists. Now what I mean is where it counts, because obviously there's many stories which show us the traitors, their dealings with demons, how they were turned against the Emperor. In First Heretic we get the musings from central figures complaining about the Emperor and so forth. We get these ideas about the primordial truth and there are revelations about possible futures. It always seems as if more is revealed to us from the loyalist perspective in terms of the really key things which underpin the development of the Imperium, especially as well in terms of human history and what brought Malkador and the Emperor to this point. That's the difference. So when Malkador, for example, in the Sigilite, tours the deepest depths of the Imperial Palace and reveals what I've often hinted at before now, the vault of all human knowledge and history has been long kept. Ancient artifacts, technology and weaponry. Seemingly though, no STC or AI that were shown to us, but you would imagine that would be a good thing to keep. We're also given a glimpse of where the Primarchs were first conceptualized and experimented with. There's always a sense when it comes to Malkador and the Emperor that things have gone very, very badly wrong though, which does somewhat undermine my common assertion that perhaps the Emperor had this grand plan and that everything is occurring actually as he wished for it to be, including the end of the heresy and him being interred on the Golden Throne. If things are going very, very wrong, that kind of doesn't work. Malkador regularly also comments as much that things aren't really going great. The Emperor as well, and then of course there is the game in the board is set where Malkador plays a projection of the Emperor, and they're playing this game seemingly that they've played many times. It's essentially the Horus Heresy. They're playing out pieces of the Primarchs and so forth. But in the board is set, this game that they've played so many times ends differently, this time with the Emperor in the singular final position before Terra, in the position of the Fool, and he's standing alone against Horus. This is an unusual outcome and remains uncertain, which is troubling for Malkador. There's a lot more we could speculate about Malkador and his past, you could go off on many threads, like just what were the Sigilites up to, what were these atrocities that Horus speaks of, and what purpose do they have? Do they undermine the validity of the Emperor and Malkador's claims to hold this moral authority to rule over humanity, that it is in the view of the Emperor necessary to bring order to a self-destructive humanity? The other thing to think about is just when did Malkador meet the Emperor? Was it much longer in the past than we're led to believe, and who brought this grand scheme forward? Did they conceive everything together? How much of it was the Emperor and how much of it was Malkador? 
The Sigilite always positions himself, as I say, below the Emperor, always referring to the Emperor as Master, but who knows how much of that is just for appearances. As has been alluded to already by other Perpetuals, the Emperor's actions seem to be largely unsupported by them, perhaps for good reason they were concerned that it would lead to exactly what did occur. On the other hand, many Perpetuals seem to have taken a position that seemingly disconnects themselves from any responsibility about the future of humanity, they just think it's not up to them. Malkador and the Emperor appear to have taken the opposite view that it was entirely necessary that they interfere. Now interesting again, but what's the point of this bit? Well, I guess the idea here is that the Emperor for all of his enigmatic storytelling and philosophical musings was seemingly winging it. He didn't set out to become a god for humanity, but maybe that is how things have turned out, so in a sense the Emperor is a false god. For if he is a godlike being now after having psycho souls poured into him for 10,000 years, all that remains is nothing of the being who walked alongside Malkador. The fact that Gilliman as well seems to be taking some serious consideration in M41 to the plausibility of supernatural intervention is quite the sign that things are not as clear cut as they may have appeared to be for those who survived the heresy in its immediate aftermath. In fact it's ever more looking like perhaps Lorgar may have been right all along. The Emperor is a riddle wrapped in an enigma, partially deliberately, partially through the obscuring mists of time. There are so many angles to take when evaluating the righteousness of the actions of Malkador and the Emperor. Did they have the right to force humanity down this path? Would it have survived otherwise? Very possibly yes, as I've said, there were some very advanced human civilizations, and were it not for the Emperor, I believe there's a very good possibility that humanity would have developed in this very technological way that the Emperor wanted to, without all of the Primarchs. So instead of saving humanity, I think there's a very good possibility that the Emperor is the cause of the doom of humanity. And as has been noted repeatedly, much of the grandeur and guiding ideologies that the Emperor espoused as being so important were crushed and dismissed at every opportunity along the way, laying out clear moral plans for humanity to be the rulers of their own destiny, but then this is just crushed whenever it is inconvenient. This occurred almost from the outset, as we know in Valdor Birth of the Imperium. This is the enduring and bizarre duality of the figures of the Sigilite and the Emperor. They seem to continually contradict their own choices and actions, on the one hand benevolent saviours for humanity, on the other a litany of crimes, evidences demonstrating immoral cruelty, almost sociopathic disregard for human life, rationalising it by an ends justifying the means, balancing of ethics, which reminds you of a few inquisitors. In this regard, I believe we see elements of Malkador shine through from his ancient past, this figure willing to do anything at the cost of anyone to secure his vision and that may be of his order. Perhaps this is why Malkador and the Emperor are so inextricably linked. Although they present their master-subordinate relationship, they appear united in their belief in what they wish to see and what they're setting the foundations of. As I say, much like Inquisitors who would tolerate any level of broken morality so long as the ultimate goals are fulfilled, the preservation of the human species and the isolation from or destruction of those beings within the warp. The question is, who is right about the direction for humanity, or maybe it should be who has the right to make that decision? Is it even acceptable for a being such as the Emperor to force a course of action built atop a house of cards of lies, contradiction, murder, and an annihilation of all moral standards that define humanity. Malkador and the Emperor's desperate rationalizations spread so thinly they cannot cover the fact that few if any humans really had a choice in what was to come, merely they were dictated to by a dictator, and for any who questioned it along the way, very often with legitimate ethical and moral merits, they were supposedly the keystones of the new Imperium, those would be simply quietly eliminated or exiled. There's a reason, perhaps, that Malkador is also the master of the assassins. Horus had learned by the time of the heresy the nature of the Emperor and Malkador. He knew they were hypocritical and twisted everything to suit their own ends as he dictated to the Khan. Now Horus, of course, got also twisted and played himself but he got a lot of things right. The Imperial Truth was founded on lies from the very beginning. The galaxy cannot therefore be justly ruled by our father or any who support it, he said. Malkador, meanwhile blowing smoke into the eyes of Primarchs who came close to turning against the Emperor, who had listened to Horus and felt they were close 
to coming to some understanding. The Sigilite would obfuscate this clarity by stating, never never underestimate the damage that a poorly crafted lie can inflict, nor also the restorative power of consensual ignorance. The trick is in knowing which truths to bury, which records to burn, and which proclamations to deny. To scream falsehood over anything that would oppose you is the way of the witless demagogue. A little contradiction is healthy. Like a pinch of salt in the gruel, it makes the whole meal a little easier to swallow. He also states, Because I have to be able to believe, when all else is done, that should they so wish, even the greatest monsters of our time can yet be redeemed and forgiven. Now, in that context, we are supposed to perhaps assume that he's speaking about those such as Horus, but I think it equally works in a self-reflective way. Which to you sounds the more believable and the more palatable, Horus's interpretation or the Emperor and Malkador? Now, there are of course many, many, many more speculations about the Emperor, origins of the Imperium and characters therein. In fact, I have near enough already to do a follow-up video immediately after this, because whilst I was smashing through this first script and thinking about the possibilities that have pinged in the brain over the years, or the more common ones we've all seen by now. I have though, no doubt you guys will also want to enthusiastically explain your own ideas in the comments below, so here's an idea. If you do, I maybe can include one or two in the second instalment video. So as I always say, drop your thoughts please in the comments. We're talking specifically about speculative origins and or meanings of the Emperor. I hope you enjoyed this adjacent exploration of the Emperor. As always, if you did, please remember to hit the likes for the like god. It helps the channel and more importantly to appease our Lord and Savior, the Leviathan algorithm god. So I'll be back soon, soon with an asterisk. As always, appreciate you all. See you in the next one.